Hello, everybody. Hello and welcome. My name is Mark. This is Riffle Shuffle and Roll, and today I'm going to be uh, talking about Trickster Pitch and doing a deep analysis of the game on that website. Now, that's my main topic for the day, a deep dive into everything that Trickster Pitch has to offer, kind of a review of the game on there, and then uh, my favorite way to play, my preferred way to play. But until that point in the show, I go ahead and go, I'm going to go ahead and talk about what I've been playing and any news and updates to that I have to share with you. So, not I uh, haven't been playing a lot of variety. We got Dewey and his decimals in the chat. Hello, hello, and welcome. I haven't been playing a large variety of games um, over the past few weeks. If you've been following along with the channel then you know that the <laughs> I've been just playing a lot of pitch. I've been doing a really, really deep dive into that game. Um, it quickly rose to the very top of the ranks for me. It is my number one game, my number one trick taker. And it's, I, it's, it's one of those things where it's like when I'm not playing it, I'm thinking about it. So it's really got its, hook, its hooks in me right now. All right, now, before I start going on a rant about pitch let's get going with uh what's been going on here so i just launched a game on the website called hoffer i do not have a video for this it is going to be out this week hoffer uh, really does sit comfortably within the precision well, i call it precision bidding family or predictive bidding uh like ohec and wizard and um spades i guess spades is a partnership precision bidding game so Hoffer, in short, is a precision bidding game like OHEC, where there is a range of hand sizes. Players will move up and down the river in hand size, and they will make a bid based on how many tricks they think they're going to capture, and then you play out the round. And at the end of the game, whoever has the most points wins. So what sets it apart from what's all already out there? Well, the driving motivation for Hoffer was to create something that is best for two or three players. This plays two to four. Uh, playing at four was just uh, a happy accident. I wanted a game that I could play with just one other person or with a third that didn't have a huge kitty. I wanted a game that was... Uh, that had a smaller deck, so it could be tighter gameplay, not so much wild variability there in which cards are out in play. And I wanted a game that a smaller group could play, but it's not going to take forever. So to answer all those needs, um, I came up with Hoffer, and then with the help of my playgroup, my cousins, we developed it. We, we played it to death, and uh, we've got our pretty good game for two or three so what really sets it apart what answers those needs so it is a euchre deck nine through ace in all four suits 24 cards plus two jokers uh taking a page from wizard you have a high joker and a low joker so the high joker always wins and it's wild you can play at any time the low joker always loses it's wild you can play at any time so you got a tight 26 card deck, and I notice I use the word euchre. Uh, I incorporate the Bauer system, and I think, you know, not to I guess, not to get too braggadocious, but like, I think the the Bauer system, the movement of the jacks in rank based on which suits trump, really, <laughs> it accomplishes the same thing. The adding um, power cards or or card or more ranks with abilities if you look at skull king for example there's four suits one is always trump but then there are mermaids and pirates and the skull king and and the whale and the kraken and there's treasure and ships and there's all these different powers and and that is the lure of that game it's a everything in the kitchen sink precision bitter and that is why skull king is so awesome and very popular because there's so much versatility you can make the game as 
wild or as simple as you want. It accommodates larger groups, which is always a perk of, of that style of game that in like Ohek can play up to seven very comfortably. And I, I think the Bowers capture that spirit and then it uses the cards that are already there. So for those who don't know, a Bower is just a Jack and that's usually referencing to the Jack as it's moved up in rank. So let's say hearts or trump, the Jack of hearts becomes the highest ranking card. And the Jack of, what did I say hearts? So the Jack of diamonds, the other red Jack becomes the second highest ranking card. It's, it's not seen, that particular system is not seen a lot in American card games, except for Euchre and sometimes Pitch. But I've noticed that the the jacks and when a jack and an offsuit jack are incorporated in a, in a game of pitch, they're normally not referred to as bowers. They're either just called the jack and the off jack or uh, jack and jick, which is pretty interesting. I think uh, bowers, you know, referring to them as bower, which means farmer, or it's just another term for jack in German. Uh, that's a carryover, euchre being a, a game uh, from the Pennsylvania Dutch that term was incorporated in Euchre, not necessarily in other American games. So in this game, a trump suit will be called and the jack of that trump suit becomes the highest ranking card aside from the high joker. And the uh, left bower, the same colored joke jack, becomes the second highest ranking card in the trump suit. And it's part of that trump suit. So that's one thing that sets this, this game apart. You've got your smaller deck um which means in the long run uh especially when you're up the river a smaller kitty more cards in play um which makes things a little more interesting because you know that joker is going to be out there most likely uh both of them and then the bower system can really throw a wrench into the works because based on how the trump suit is called so in oheck the trump suit is determined by a turn up card, so it's random. In Skull King, the trump suit is always the pirate flag, the black suit. And in Wizard, it's a turn up card as well. And then if a, if a wizard's turned up, the dealer picks. If a jester's turned up, nobody picks. There is no trump. So in my game in Hoffer, the dealer gets to pick. Uh, they get to look at their hand after the cards are dealt, and they get to pick a trump suit. Now, that is offset by the fact that they will be playing to the first trick last. So even though they're given a little power in picking the trump suit, the player to their left determines you know, the, the, uh, the way that first trick is going to go with their lead card. So eh, I think it's pretty balanced in that, in that sense. Also, uh, the dealer is allowed to pick no trump, which is a nice tool in their pocket, especially if you're sitting there with uh, aces, right? And you know that jack is going to beat them, then, and you want to ensure that you get those tricks because being precise with your bid and capturing more tricks is a higher score. So you call no trump, and the only thing you got out there that might mess with you is the high joker, you can really rack up some points. So it's a nice tool in the toolbox for the dealer. Again, though, what they have to do on that first trick is determined by the trick leader, the player on their left, or the eldest hand, as it's called. So you've got small deck, the bowers, you've got the dealer calling trump. And then the other thing that sets this apart is after the dealer has called trump, each player bids, but the bid is simultaneous. Skull King does this by having the players pound on the table and then show their bid at the same time. I like that method. I think that fits the flavor of this game well. Um, but what I also suggest in the rules is to use a second deck because at most there's only eight tricks uh, at the top of the river for this game. For the a player count of two and three, each player will get eight cards. So you only need ace through eight 
in each suit from a second deck. So you just make sure the deck has a different back, and you give each player one suit's worth of cards, ace through eight, and then they can use those cards to bid. And if they want to bid zero, they just keep the card face down when everybody reveals it. And I think that's a pretty slick way of simultaneously bidding. If you just use your hands like in Skull King, you've got to document the bid. So you have to stop, and there's a little bit of an interruption. And I didn't really like that. I didn't think that flowed quite as nicely. I noticed that playing Skull King and Wizard, and you got to stop and write down everybody's bid. It just it just really slows the game down. Um, especially if you're playing with a larger group, and if people are talking and, and horsing around and having fun, you got to keep giving back to them, being like, hey, what was your bid? What was your bid? Go around the table. And of course, are they going to just sit there with their fingers out? What? A, of course, you're going to have the person that's like, oh, man, I can't remember. Let me look at my hand again real quick. And it's just kind of a problem. So I think the second deck for bidding takes care of that. And then the last thing is the scoring system. I think that's this is something that really sets it apart. Um, first of all, if you bid zero, you have to get zero. A lot of times in games like this, a zero bid is kind of a safe bid, especially in the bigger hands, um, but not in this game. If you even get one trick, you do not get any points. So the zero bid is hard to earn, but it earns you 10 points. It's the second best way to score if you do it accurately every time. And then uh, if you go under your bid, you just get one point per trick. If you meet your bid, you get 10 points plus the value of your bid. And then if you go over your bid, it's like you reset. So if you bid three, if you capture one, you get one point. Two, two points. Three, you get 13 points. Ah, oh, darn it, you captured four, you're back at one, one point. And then you get one point beyond that. So I think of it as kind of a meter. Once you hit your bid, you're at the red line. You don't want to go any further. And if you do, boom, you're starting over. So at that point, you're motivated to just take all the tricks if you can, because that's the only way you're going to get any points or a substantial number of points. So there you go. That is Hoffer. The rules are available on uh, riffleshuffleandroll.com and Board Game Geek. It's on there as well. If you have an account and you want to uh, give the game a shot and give it a little review or give some feedback in the forums, that'd be wonderful. And I'm always looking for proofreading feedback for the rule book. The rules are living documents. That's kind of one of the perks of just publishing online. Um, any mistakes found or clarifications needed, I can make them and then update everybody that changes have been made. You don't even need to print them because you can always just access them on live online. So that is Huffer. I am, I've been working hard on uh, getting Dickery finished. Uh, just doing a little bit at a time, trying to do that alongside uh, some of the other projects that I'm working on and also taking care of the family, you know. And uh, that, that game uses a really, fun clock mechanism and I'm just designing a nice printable clock. Uh, they had one already but the game was originally designed with just numbered cards 1 through 12 because it uses a clock. It's part of the theme and uh, I wanted to adapt it because for you guys, for my audience, it's a 52 card pack. Ace through Queen is what's going to be used to play this game. So I am modifying the clock just a smidgen. I'm making a really nice looking one, like a vintage clock with the cool font. The, it's the Rye font on Google. So it looks like an old clock. And then I just snuck a little Jack, Queen, and Ace under the 11, 12, and 1. Um, I just need to go through now and get everything lined up and ready to go. And then I can get this, uh, get this published. But the game's already available over on Board Game Geek. It's just called Dickery. It's the rules are really nicely written and understandable. Um, there's already a really good crowd of people playing and enjoying the game. You can even play it on Tabletopia, if I'm not mistaken, or Tabletop Simulator, one of those. And of course, you can play it on PCIO, PlayingCards.io, and you can print the clock off and your, the clock that they made already, if you want, and scribble on. But I'm gonna have um, a riffle shuffle and roll edition, I guess you could call it, ready here in the coming days. All right, let's move on. Uh, I want to announce the Pitch Club. Here, let me move my face over here. The Pitch Club on Board Game Geek. 
So this is a guild. If you have a Board Game Geek account, you can join the guild. Just search in guilds for the Pitch Club. Um, I will put the link in the description here after the video. It's just uh, boardgamegeek.com slash guild slash 4014. You can see it here in the video. Um, or you can just Google, or you can just search the Pitch Club there in the search bar under guild. And I've got, we got 12 members already. This is pretty cool. And I haven't been pushing this out too hard, uh, just in a couple places. But if you are active on Board Game Geek and you are a pitch player, I really uh, suggest joining up here. We are discussing uh, the different versions of play, the different ways to play pitch in different games in the all four families. I'm starting to kind of catalog those here. Uh, we've got strategy talk and um, organizing play on Trickster, and it's, it's, it's really nice. And then branching off of that, I have, I've started, I'm slowly building a Discord that is somewhat for the channel, Riffle Shuffle and Rule, but the main focus is organized play and getting people connected online to play games. You can already go over, if you just want to talk about games and maybe find people, find rare and interesting games, um, there's already, you can go to the traditional card game channel. My Discord, which is called the Card House, like Haas, H-A-U-S, um, is going to be focusing on organized play, specifically within Trickster, American card games, American classics, um, and I, I want to have a focus like that mm, because A, those are the games that I really love. B, Trickster is a great platform that allows people to play very easily. And C, focusing on American card games like that will kind of help ensure that we get players that are within the same time zone or at least near it. Um, because... As you'll find, if you head, if you go to the traditional card game Discord server, there's a lot of people on the other side of the world that play, and it's very hard to coordinate with them. Uh, so, yeah, those three things are the motivation behind this, and I thought it would be nice to have a way to uh, start organizing and getting getting people playing together more consistently. So, as of now, as of now, if you join the Pitch Club on Board Game Geek, uh, because you're a pitch player or you want to learn the game, it's an excellent game. Uh, I will invite you to the Discord so you can start playing. We have a pitch session once a week, normally on Thursdays. So now I'm going to be, um, I'll be opening this up more as I get more familiar with the platform with Discord, and I'm able to feel comfortable kind of regulating it as it grows. Right now, I think it's at, oh, it's it's creeping up on 20, 20 people. And it's a, it's a nice little group. We're all Eastern Standard Time people. So we're able to, or for the most part, Eastern Central, you know, United States time zone. So we're able to coordinate playtimes very easily. Oh, yeah. Dewey says the Hearts game last Saturday was top notch. Yep. Dewey's in the Discord. Uh, and, yeah, we had a pretty rousing game of Hearts. It was awesome. couple games. So yeah, 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 yeah. If you're interested in pitch for now and you want to join the pitch club or if you're interested in the classics on Trickster uh, or American card games, organized play, please contact me through Board Game Geek. And I'm treating it like it's a, it's a sports club. This is, I want good sportsmanship in the, the Discord. I'm not going to tolerate any any disrespectfulness or goofiness um this is where people will come to play games to find matches to play and uh once it starts to build and i can start keeping track of wins and losses we can have leaderboards and uh tournaments i have held i have held a gin rummy tournament over in the traditional card game channel as well as or server as well as a uh, schnapsen tournament and I really like doing that. I really like organizing it, keeping the stats. Um, 
I think that is a lot of fun. And I think that's just a lot of, I was, uh, I, you know, I played quite a few sports in high school. I coached while I was a teacher. I've always liked athletics and I think, and that's how I look at cards. <laughs> it's, it's a sport <laughs> and maybe not in the, uh, physical athletic sense, but definitely in the mental one. So yeah, there you have it. The card house moving on. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, I've got a geek list on board game geek that is committed a hundred percent to the trickster nine, as I like to call it, call them. And these are all the, these are the nine American classics on trickster. And I just recently had a game of Euchre, um, very cut and dry Euchre. There are some other options to, to fiddle with, but I just played turn up, play to 10, uh, partnership game, two versus two, standard Euchre deck, nine through days, and then stick the dealer. To me, the stick the dealer is a must to be able to just pass um, on a bad hand. I mean, if you, and it's, it's an advantage for the dealer to have that option because if they're sitting there with a middling hand that they really should do something with and everybody else has passed, then they are in a position to, to make the call. And if they're, if the chances are that they don't have a good hand at all, then they just need to ride out the deal. And you can always count on your partner for one. And if everybody else has passed, then nobody's got a stellar hand. Um, I think stick the dealer just, and it keeps the game moving. So I'm a fan of that rule. And I got to say, after playing pitch for weeks, uh, moving back into Euchre was very strange. Very strange. Pitch is the full deck, 52 cards. You, It's May Trump, so uh, you can follow suit. But if you have Trump, you can also play Trump. So there's more cards, which means there's more variety in play. Uh, there's more choices to be made while you're playing. And in pitch, every trick does not matter. So you can play your cards strategically to uh, avoid a trick that is worthless or to capture a trick that is uh, full of points. So moving from that to Euchre, where it's a five card hand, 24 card deck, uh, only four cards are not in play. You must follow suit and you get one chance to, you know, your your bid is dependent upon the turn up card. Wow, I just felt like I was just shoved into a little box. Um, and it didn't take long for me to fall back into the rhythm of the game. And it was a really close match. Uh, I was playing, so I had, a, I had a bot and the guy I was playing had a bot. And it was a grind all the way to the end. It was eight to eight. I was the, my, my opponent was the dealer, my partner passed, the bot passed, it was eight to eight. If I didn't pick it up and I passed, I was basically flipping a coin on whether um, the other player was going to be able to make a, make a bid. And I did, I, uh, I just didn't feel comfortable giving him that shot. So I, I went for it and I was just like one card shy. He I got we got set and we lost. But it was a good it was a good match. So yeah. I went for it, had to, because I didn't want to be put in the position where I basically handed him the win and it didn't turn out for me that time. So uh, I am starting the dive into Trickster Euchre again. I've already done some live plays. So uh, if, if I do some more live plays of Euchre, it's going to be with the more interesting settings turned on. Um, and I've already had my share of uh, Euchre experts comment on my videos and tell me what I, uh, it's just terrible to watch, hard to watch. I don't know what I'm doing. I just delete those. Those people are toxic. They think if they're winning at Euchre, they're winning at life, and that's just not how it works. So, but I will definitely be showing off some of the features. Now, the interesting thing is with pitch, there's a ton of ways to play, which we're gonna get, in, get into today. 
but with Euchre, there's just a few setting options that you can fiddle with. Um, so it won't make for quite as long of a dive. There are some interesting Euchre varieties out there that are not on Trixer, but it really is hard, unless you're playing bid, there's not really too much you can do to turn up to make it a wildly different game. Uh, once you start getting into like draws or exchanges with the kitty, you are getting into like Bure territory or Hucklebuck, Huckle, Hucklebuck or Buck Euchre. There's some other options that are essentially like a, a draw game. But yeah. So yeah, gave Euchre another shot. Felt very constricting. Um, it's definitely not going to pull me back from pitch. But it's got its place in my my life as one of those kind of comfort food games. So let's see. Covered Hoffer. Covered the Pitch Club. Talked about Euchre. Talk, showed you Trickster 9. That's another thing that if you get on Board Game Geek, you can follow along with me on that. Ah, so, okay. So before we get into Pitch here, um, I, I just want to throw out a little Easter egg that... I have a, <laughs> amid, amidst all of the other projects, Honeypot is a game in development for me. Um, I still have Goosed being worked on. Basically, I have this nice calendar of games that I'm trying to, and I would like to stretch out over the year so there is a nice trickle of games coming out. That way there is something fresh to be played and enjoyed. So, Goosed Goost is a trick-taking card game for four, four only, and its main hook is that there are variable partnerships. You don't know who your partner is going to be. It is like Doppelkopf in that sense, that partnerships are determined during the game, but it is different. It's not based on who is dealt which card. It, you know, in Doppelkopf, it is whoever gets the black queens are partners. Um, and in this, it's whoever first plays a goose card, uh, four, and who captures the four is on a team. So there's a little more choice. There is a scoring bonus for the go for the team that for that team that comes together. They're the red foxes. There's a scoring bonus for being the red fox, but there's also a penalty if you get too greedy and are forced to capture all the goose cards. So there is an advantage to being the other team, the White Foxes. You can trip up your opponent, f opponents, force them to capture all the geese, and then you get the big scoring bonus instead of them. Um, it has a nice uh, balance between working together but also being greedy because you're... Um, you have your own self-interests. Only one person can win the game. You still earn points for the tricks that you capture. So as an individual, you're balancing <coughs> you're balancing capturing tricks and geese for your own good with also using your partner's help, but also not letting them get ahead of you when you have that opportunity. And then if if you're if you don't want to take that risk, and you're a white fox, then your uh, your goal is to balance capturing tricks with goosing your opponent. Um, it's a fun little game, and that's the hook, the variable partnership with the greedy factor of of goosing your opponent. If you become the red fox, you don't want to capture all the geese, and that it's got a good amount of play sessions. And I think the game is at a point where I really want to just start trying to break it. After the last session, I got that little bug that I'm like, I can add more to this, but that's not the kind of that's not the kind of game designer I am. I don't like games where it's layer upon layer upon layer. I like games with one solid hook, and then maybe a couple little things sprinkled in for spice. So I started to add. Uh, solo contracts mimicking Doppelkopf a little more and it just didn't feel right and so I, I'm, I think I'm going to take those away 
I need to just get a few more runs of Goose in. But of course, with it being a four-player game, that's incredible. You would think it wouldn't be too hard to coordinate three others. Uh, but it is. It is. <laughs> so I'll, I need to just get a few more plays of that in. And it should be good to go for the fall. Um, hot Dog is basically done. I just need to get the images into the rule book. So that will be ready for summer, maybe even sooner. And then Sishare 6 has taken a really nice turn where we had a really nice light bulb moment after the last play session. And there was something going on with 9-9. Nine -nine, it's basically a free-for-all every round. And based on how that game works, the free-for-all aspect is good. Uh, in in Sisher 6, there is just a little bit of a different dynamic because of how the, the kitty works with the game and how you are able to shoot the moon in this game. What was happening, which what I didn't see, was that I was essentially creating a two versus one dynamic. Um, the player that first captures a nine gets the kitty and that sets up a 2v1 dynamic and I just didn't really see that. I was still thinking of it as a free-for-all. So when we came to that realization at the end of the session, it was like an aha moment. Like this is a game with dynamic partnerships but in a 2v1 sense. Uh, so my again my my allegory for the game or my uh my metaphor for the game still stands you are three people chosen by fate one of you will escape i've always kind of seen it as people in a pit trying to get out only one may get out two people might be working together to yank one down while the other one is plotting to be the one to get free and just this constant struggle between three people um, and it still fits that very nicely so with all those things, with the the uh, the ribbon getting tied on those three projects or four projects, however many I said, I've got Honeypot, which is my take on the Hilo Jack family, which is Pitch, All Fours, Fat, Don, and Cinch and Pedro and all those games. And uh, I am very excited for this one. One of the one of the perks to using pre existing systems like Hoffer is an OHEC skeleton with my my sort of style attached to it. And 9-9 nine -nine was hearts and and euchre kind of fused together and, and into an even tighter game. Um, Honeypot is is my pitch inspiration. So I use the high low jack as a skeleton, but I've changed quite a bit within it. I think it's going to be a very nice uh, it's going to be a very nice take on the family so i'm excited to get that out there all right let's dive into the main topic guys guys and gals trickster cards or trickster pitch okay so as you can see there are a large variety of ways to play trickster or ways to play pitch on trickster some of these variations have names of their own. There, there's lots of names for different pitch variations, um, like Omaha or Oklahoma, uh, Nebraska pitch, Jersey pitch, and those names kind of represent the point value within. But really, when you get down to the nitty gritty and you start talking about um, hand sizes, kitty exchanges, and draws, uh, the point values of cards how you score the cards, the placement of the joker, there is a large range of variation depending on which region of the country you're in, which house you're in on that block. Every family has sort of their developed way of playing the game. Um, and that is something I really, really like. I refer to it as a, a nice menu of options. You can play this game how you want. And I think that's pretty cool. The downside is it makes it very, very hard to kind of document uh, how it's played to try to collect all these different ways to play. 
which is which is something that I'm trying to do, and that's uh, it's been a lot of fun actually researching that and just seeing how from the 1600s on this game has developed over you know, 400 years to go from all fours to just the wild variety of pitch games over that period of time it's just awesome it's awesome and as, and as you go through the different editions of Hoyle uh, the oldest one I have is the 1873 so by then the all fours had been around for 200 years and had seen its own changes to the 1922 Hoyle so just a matter of 50 years ish to see changes made in the rules and you can actually see notes of new rules coming to now it's just it's really cool and that's something that i think for me honeypot for me honeypot is 20 20 21st century pitch you know the game can move on and change and evolve to kind of fit more modern gaming tastes so here we go we've got eight ways of playing pitch four point four five six and seven and then nine ten eleven and thirteen these you would think these would be grouped based on a certain feature but nine point is actually better grouped with four five and six and then seven point is actually better grouped with ten eleven and thirteen um there are more varieties aside from this there are different point values you can play for uh, that are out there but i think trickster's done a nice job kind of standardizing the main point values that you can play for and then giving you a menu of rule settings and <laughs> i'm probably coming off as like i'm endorsed by trickster but i am not um i just really enjoy this platform i like how it's uh, cross compatible and how easy it is to organize games with real people. So, four point is the most basic. Uh, you've got your your high, your low, your jack, and your game. So whatever the highest trump card is in play, that's a point. Lowest, that's a point. And then of course the jack, which may or may not be in play, and then the game, which is made up of the game points. Within four point, you can play uh, cutthroat. Two, three, and four. You can play teams, two v two, and on here you can play six player, three teams of two, which is sort of a bummer, because that is not very fun, at all. There's especially with no kitty, uh, and no, well, five times that's thirty cards. You're not going to have much for a draw, so all you can do is the kitty, and it is just it's not very fun, um, but. A lot of people who play six player four point pitch will play three versus three, so two teams of three. And they have said that the 2v2v2 is terrible and 3v3 is pretty fun. And I just think it's a kind of a shame you can't play that on here. You can play three versus three euchre. So I don't know if Trickster is going to continue to develop all these different varieties so that there's the max amount of settings or i don't know if they're done i don't know where they're at in their development uh, i have requested games before and they blatant they very bluntly said we're not adding any more games so i don't know what their big picture plan is uh, we're not bombarded with ads when we play i'm always surprised when i see one because it had been so long since i've seen one so i don't know what what they're going to do i would like to see them continue to expand it I'm okay with seeing ads more regularly if that means that I can still play for free um, as long as they're getting something out of it through ad views. Um, if they went to like a deluxe model where you had to pay, whew, I, I would probably pay for it just because I use it all the time. And I think it's such a great platform, especially if they use that money <coughs> to continue to develop it. So... Uh, yeah, four point, cutthroat, two through, through four, or partnerships, and then a, a less desirable six player mode. Um, five point adds the offsuit jack, which for euchre people, that would just be the left bower. 
The Jacks stay in their ranking position though. So it adds a fifth point there. Uh, essentially plays the same. It's still good at uh, cutthroat two, three, and four, and two v two. The that extra point doesn't really change the dynamic of play too much. It does present the bidder with an interesting choice if they're sitting there with the offsuit jack. Um, do they count on that point? Because that can be taken by the higher jack, the queen, the king, and the ace. So there's four cards that can capture it. It's pretty low on the totem pole. So you always... Ah, I've, I've been uh, thrown off by that jack a few times. And then we've got uh, six point, which adds the uh, joker for the first time. So again... You're adding a point card right in the upper middle. Yeah, the upper middle of the deck. Um, on Trickster, that Joker sits between the Jack and the 10. So it would go Ace, King, Queen, uh, Jack, Jack, Joker, 10. Now, one thing I want to mention is that in a lot of the literature that I have, that that Joker is often placed below the 2 without counting as the low and it's called the snoozer i have actually not seen it placed between the jack and the 10 um in like hoyle or parlet's book or whatever so i just want to throw that out there i think the jack below the two is a more compelling card because it counts as a point but it's still not the low so the two or the three or the four or whatever happens to be out still counts as a point as well and the Joker doesn't capture anything in the Trump suit. So it's a very, very weak card that you need to protect. I think I like that option more than putting the Jack in between the, or putting the Joker between the Jack and the 10. Uh, and then we've got, okay, I'm going to jump over seven point for a second. So staying within that particular group, we have the nine point ver variation, which um, is high, low, Jack, and then five and then game. So the trump suited five is worth five points. So you're back to the original four, high, low, jack, and game, but then the trump suited five is worth five points. And I uh, I like this version. For a while there, I was preferring this. That five can really be a lifesaver in your bid. So you can bid, uh, I think the minimum bid is still two or three, but you can bid four, right and only have the ace out of the deal but manage to capture the five at some point with some worthless trump card and meet your bid um, bids tend to go a little higher here but even with a couple of points in your hand like the ace and maybe a jack you can still bid seven and count on that five being out there even though there's still there's a chance it might not be out there um, so this game incorporates a draw and a kitty exchange. So that's why it's grouped down there with 10, 11, and 13, because the bid winner gets three cards from the kitty, and then, uh, everybody gets to choose three to six cards to discard from their hand, and they draw back up to six. Um, now I think I want to note here that a uh, variation of pitch that uses the trump five as a point card is typically called pedro or cinch and then there's double pedro where the off five is also five points and that so that would be a 14 point pitch essentially there's a version called pig that i've come across where both fives are in the game and it's a 14 point pitch oh and there's two jokers so it's it's 16 which is wild I think it was 16 or 15 because I can't remember if there's one or two jokers, but as you can see, you can spice the game up however you want. Um, so those are the main, I think the more, the most compelling ways to play four through nine, four, five, six, and nine, because there's um, just a small variety in what points are available. It doesn't get too swingy. The fives and nine point are just enough to spice it up 
maybe help you get your bid that was risky if it's out in play and you capture it, but also it's out there to really hose you if you don't get it. And then you also don't get enough to make your bid. Um, I also like the draw in this version on Trickster and Nine Point because you don't just dump all your non-Trump cards. I mean, you can, but it's not forced. You choose three to six cards to discard or uh, up to six cards. If you're the dealer, you choose three to nine because you got the three kitty cards. Um, okay, so yeah, I, I can kind of clue you in on my feelings here by saying those four are my preferred way to play, or at least to me the more optimal ways to play. Then we get down into the bigger point value. So seven point introduces the, the draw where you just ditch all your non-Trump cards. There's no kitty. I think you can't even turn it on for the four player game. But with seven point, everybody gets a hand of six cards. You bid based on those six. And then beginning with the player left of the bid winner, everybody dumps all their non-Trump, keeps the Trump they have, and then they get uh, cards in their hand back up to six. And then the dealer gets to do, or the bid winner does that last. And then you play. And typically you only play with Trump. And in that, it's ace, two, so not high-low anymore. The points are for the ace, for the two, for the jack, for the off-jack, the two jokers, and then the ten. So the dynamic of the game changes a bit there. You no longer have the game point. All the points are um, above, are ten and above except for that two. And if the two is not in play, you just don't get that point. If any of those cards are not in play... You just do not get those points. Um, with 10 point, they add the trump three. So again, that's something that may or may not be in play. And again, it's bid, dump, non-trump, draw back up, and play. So uh, the 11 point, the 11 point does something that I think is interesting. So it's the same as 10, but it adds a second ace kind of like a left bower, but for the ace. So if diamonds is trump, the ace of diamonds is the highest card, and the ace of hearts becomes the second highest card. Now, I actually really like that part because if you're sitting there with the off ace, you can't count on that as a point anymore. <laughs> and so with four-point pitch, with regular pitch, you've got a 54% chance that the king is high. So it's basically a coin flip that the ace is in play. There's a 30% chance that the queen is high. So if you lead a queen and the ace and the king are not in play, you beat the odds big time. Now you add that second ace and you throw off that whole dynamic because now there's more cards in the trump suit and now it's a good chance that the ace, the offsuit ace, is not enough. And it's a really good chance that the king is not enough. And then you, you shouldn't even think about betting on the queen. So it really throws off that whole dynamic. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. And that placement is just so dangerous. Putting it clear up at the top like that, it's kind of it's essentially a bower. But it's, it's kind of like using the jacks, but it feels different. And especially here because you also have the trump jack and the off jack. So as you can see, when we go up in these point values, you're just really stretching out the trump suit. You combine that with a draw and you're guaranteeing that point cards and trump cards are in play. And that does add a nice, exciting element to the game. Uh, so that was 11 point. And then finally, you've got 13, which goes back to just ace, two, jo jack, off jack, joker, joker. And then three, three. So there's six points out there available with just the threes. Um, yeah, let's go to the chat here. Dewey says, in high, an 11 point, is the off ace a trump card? Yes, it is. Yep, the off suit ace joins the trump suit. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, 
yeah, so that is that is the large variety. Let me put it over here. That is the large variety of pitch forms that Trickster offers. There is another app called uh, Neural Play. The Neural Play Pitch app actually has other settings that Trickster doesn't. But the downside is you can only play against bots. The cool thing, you can adjust the difficulty level of the bots. And again, it has a lot of different options that Trickster doesn't have. It has Pedro and Cinch and uh, different point values. So neural play. You got to check that out. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to dive into the forms that I like the most. So after experimenting with all of these things, uh, 160 games of pitch the last time I checked, <clears throat> I really just came, I just, I started at four point, worked my way through, and just kind of landed back on four point pitch as my way to go. It seems to be the most versatile, the most approachable. Um, it is good at two, three, and four, all cutthroat. It is good with partnerships. Um, and apparently it is good at six player as well when it's 3v3. It is not good as three teams of two. That was not fun. Um, so four point pitch, cutthroat is extremely enjoyable. And then uh, I play, I like to play to 15. I like to play with uh, stick the dealer. And sometimes the only one that I kind of go back and forth on, the only setting, is dealer steals. If I'm in the mood for a meaner game, I like to turn on dealer steals, which just means if I bid a three and that's the highest bid, the dealer can also bid three. They don't have to bid higher than me. Um, for two player, which you would think two player is not a very compelling way to play, but it is. When you turn on the kitty and then do a draw after Trump's been set. So how that works, each player's dealt six cards. The non-dealer bids first. The dealer gets to bid next. The bid winner is given three cards from the kitty. Then they call the Trump suit. Then the bid loser uh, chooses cards to discard and then draws back up to six. And then the dealer does the same. So even though there's only two players, even though only six cards are dealt in the beginning to each player, 12 cards in play, by the end of it, you could have cycled through uh, almost half the deck again, 24 cards very or more because of the kitty, 27 cards. So just like that, you've gotten uh, just as many cards out as you would in a four-player game. So as the bid winner, you're kind of, you know, doing this, waiting for those cards to come from the kitty, thinking maybe that's this is going to boost my hand up enough to get that bid that I probably shouldn't have bid on. <laughs> uh, allows you, it, it really gave me that pinochle feel of I'm going to bid based on what I have and what I want from my partner. So I think the two-player game is very compelling uh, with those settings turned on. And then I think uh, in regards to the higher point values that have the draws where you dump all your non-Trump, it has a very slot machine feel. So when you're the bid winner, you are going to bid based on a couple points or based on what you're hoping to get from the kitty. And you're going to count on everything being in play. And you're pulling that slot machine lever. And when those new cards come, you're just like, I didn't get anything. <laughs> or you're like, holy smokes, I just got the ace and the queen and the jack all in my hand. And that's a pretty cool feeling. Um, so yeah, in the long run, I got back to four point. It works well at two, three, and four player or partnerships. Two player with the kitty and the draw. And I just, I don't have any... Uh, desire to play any of the other point values. I mean, unless somebody asks me, 
Heck yeah, I'll play. But if I had to set up the game and choose, I'm just going to stick with four point. Now, with all that said, as we're coming to the end here, coming to a close, I did pick up this little beauty. I you know I'm kind of in the corner. Pitch six. And this is actually a Parker Brothers slash Hasbro. So Hasbro had acquired Parker Brothers at this time, but it was Parker Brothers was still kind of its own thing. It still had its label on the game. Uh, this is 2002. I love everything about this package. This is exactly what <coughs> Hasbro should be doing now to address the growing hobby market. They should not be losing shelf space to to smaller companies that are just latching on to market to market hold because they are doing what what's going to sell. But you look back, this is 2002. You've got this sort of box, which you do not see Hasbro do. It's always the Uno style hanging from a peg kind of box. And pitch six is essentially four point pitch with the, oh shoot, what are the six points? The last trick is one, so that's five. And the six is a point. So it's high, low, jack, six, last trick, and game. And I'm going to be doing a video over this because this game is not in print. I got super, super lucky and was able to buy it brand new off Amazon. It was still sealed in the package, plastic wrapped, and everything. But it's just a deck of cards. It's a deck of cards designed for pitch. They put the point values for the game point on the cards that have them. Anything that's worth an actual point, they highlighted the rank. So it's got a bolded background. So like the Jack, the Jack of Diamonds has a red background on the J. And they added a couple extra points. The last trick, which you do not see in other forms of the game, and the six. And having the six only worth one point is a different approach. And I think that's a good placement. It's, uh, I, I would prefer the seven, which is what I have chosen um, for a little two-player pitch variant that I'm working on. But because the seven is dead smack dab in the middle. But I think the six is a cool choice. But you can play this. You do not need the deck. And they even just made it a deck of cards. The only miss with this is they didn't include a couple jokers. Which I don't know if that would have required them to go on to a whole other sheet. Because a deck of cards has two jokers, but it also has like an advertisement card. It has a couple more insert cards. And I think that just is because the printing process uses... They use up all the space on the sheets. So I don't know if Hasbro just didn't have enough room on the sheet and they didn't want to go into another one. I don't know. I don't know why they didn't just include a couple jokers because then it would have been a very, very, very useful product. But uh, what do you do? So a video for that is coming. Um, I'm working on a, a compilation of all the different variations for pitch and then all the games in the all force family which has been a lot of fun that's going to be a slow project it's essentially volume two following my gin book going gin and i think i'm going to be just rebranding this whole that whole thing into uh uh an american card player series volume one is going gin which will morph into two player rummy games and then uh Volume 2 will be Hilo Jack, Family of Games. So that is it. That is it for the night. I think I've covered all my bases. Um, again, if you're interested in the joining the Pitch Club on Board Game Geek, please get on there and join. If you're interested in um, joining the Card House Discord, send me a message through Board Game Geek or my email, and we can talk about that. Um, we can get some 
get that thing growing and get some organized play going. All right, everybody, thank you very much for joining me this evening. I'll be on tomorrow night playing something live. I don't know what yet, but it'll be something. Maybe Euchre. I've been talking about 500 now, but I've kind of leaned towards Euchre. So it'll probably be some Euchre live. Um, and then Wednesday is Card Talk. I don't know what I want to talk about this week quite yet. But, um, and more how to play videos to come. All right, that is it for now. Everybody, thank you for watching. And until next time, keep on playing.